was Heraclitus. Heraclitus was known by many names. The Riddler, the Obscure, the Weeping Philosopher, that one radical pre-Socratic who was Nietzsche's muse. But what really sets him apart in my mind was that everybody hated him. Sorry if I sound sick, it's because, uh... I'm sick. Heraclitus was born and lived in Ephesus. As a young lad, he refused any teacher whatsoever, thinking them all dull-witted, and searched for the truth on his own. Some of his most famous quotes include, Much learning does not teach understanding, otherwise it would have taught Hesiod and Pythagoras, and Homer should be thrown out of the public contests and beaten with a stick. It takes a special kind of man to have his insults recorded through history. When asked by his fellow citizens to establish laws, he would not deign to do so. Withdrawing to the Temple of Artemis, he would play dice with the children. When the Ephesians stood around him, he said, Why are you surprised, you rascals? Isn't it better to do this than to take part in your civic life? Literally anyone could get it. He also knew everything, or at least so he claimed. But beyond this veil of hubris and contempt, was a depressed man, the weeping philosopher. Theophrastus says that owing to his melancholy, he left some parts of his work half-finished, which is neither funny nor important, but is very relatable. So we've established that Heraclitus was quite the character, but what could this grouchy misanthrope have come up with to justify all his insults and questionable gambling with children? During Heraclitus's life, the question that drove the philosophic discussion was the question, what is the arche? which means, what is the fundamental unchanging basis of reality? The first to propose this question was Thales, and his answer was that it was water. The claim was a material answer. Everything is literally made of water. Thales' student Anaximander makes his answer explicitly metaphysical and rational, with the claim that the RK is a piran, the boundless. Thales' third student Anaximenes synthesizes the previous two claims into the proposal that the RK is air, something both metaphysical and material for the Greeks. This progression blurs exactly what is meant by the original question of what is the RK. Is it a metaphysical question or a material one? Heraclitus brings the conversation back to the metaphysical. We previously defined the terms being and becoming. Being is the fundamental unchanging basis of reality. Becoming is that which changes throughout time. Heraclitus's radical addition to the philosophical conversation was the complete denial of the existence of metaphysical being whatsoever. Instead, there is an acceptance of becoming a perpetual dice game, innocent as children, without the projected moral injustices and the metaphysical abstractions of Anaximander's view. A metaphysical apiron isn't necessary. All things come into being by conflict of opposites, and the sum of all things flows like a stream, and no man ever steps in the same river twice. Each moment in time comes into being and then is consumed by the next. But after all these radical changes, his answer becomes even more enigmatic to some when he then claims that the RK is fire. Is this a physical slash material view? Or is it a representation of that which consumes and forever changes? That change itself is the only constant. Each flame rises up and dissipates, passing away like a river. At last, having roasted everyone in his village, our dear Heraclitus departed for the mountains, where he lived on grass and herbs. But when this diet gave him dropsy, he returned to town and asked the doctors enigmatically if they could produce a drought after rain. They, being sick of his BS, failed to understand him. And of course, he scoffed at them and went off to solve the problem himself, as he always had. So he buried himself in cow dung, hoping it would draw the fluids out of him. But he was unable to push the cow dung off of himself and was viciously devoured by dogs. Thus, Heraclitus came to an end. Our next philosopher is Parmenides, in many regards Heraclitus' antithesis. Just as Heraclitus denies the existence of being entirely, Parmenides denies the existence of becoming, and thus Parmenides becomes the ice to Heraclitus' fire. Parmenides was born and lived in Elea. Little is written about Parmenides' life, but it is said by Theophrastus that he was a student of Anaximander. One chilly morning, Parmenides strolls on a mountain trail, looking down upon the world of confusion and irrationality. The contradictory Heraclitus, with his annoying riddles, lay there in a pile of feces below, the pinnacle of delusion. And yet, Heraclitus was right about one thing. Heraclitus saw the contradictoriness and the disparity of the double world order inherent in Anaximander's doctrine. On this, Parmenides, the lofty philosopher, agreed. But as he strolled, he dove deeper into thought. Maybe the conception of the separation of opposites was wrong entirely. The separation of opposites for Anaximander was believed to be the creation of two sides of the same coin. But maybe it isn't the creation of dueling opposites at all. 
but the existence of that which is and its possible non-existence. Light doesn't create an opposite thing, darkness, but darkness is merely the non-existence of light. There is only one thing, that which exists, and the existent could not have come to be, for out of what could it have come? Out of the non-existent, this cannot be. Out of the existent, then it would only be a reproduction of itself. Everything of which you can say it has been or it will be is not. Of the existent, you can never say it is not. The existent is indivisible. For where is the second power that could divide it? There cannot be several existents. For in order to separate them, there would have to be something which is not existent. A supposition which cancels itself. Thus, there is only one eternal unity. There is only being. And now, whenever Parmenides glances backward at the world of coming to be, the world whose existence he used to try to comprehend, he becomes angry with his eyes for so much as seeing becoming. Whatever you do, do not be guided by your dull eyes, nor your resounding ears, nor by your tongue, but test all things with the power of your thinking alone. All sense perceptions, says Parmenides, yield but illusions, and their main illusionariness lies in their pretense that the non-existent coexists with the existent, that becoming, too, has being. This cold morning brooding session would go on to radically change the trajectory of the entire Western world. His bloodless rationalism would win over mainstream philosophy, leaving Heraclitus' aesthetic life-affirming riddles a silly little footnote in the history of the pre-Socratics. Only a few bright minds would look back at the poor man stuck beneath a pile of feces and take inspiration from it, the likes of Jung and Nietzsche. Parmenides, on the other hand, would go on to influence the majority of Western philosophers. And with that, our story comes to an end. Join me next time to discuss the life and philosophy of Empedocles.